There is uh, no show like a Naeem Khan show, and it's, it's really interesting watching this on uh, the screen because I was there. And sometimes when you're at a show, sometimes it doesn't translate either way. It could look really great in person, but not so great on screen, and vice versa. This is Technicolor fabulous, and bravo, Naeem, uh, season after season. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Full disclosure, Naeem and I have uh, known each other for like, a while. Like a while. <laughs> so I have zero notes, uh, which is really interesting. I was on the way here and I was thinking, oh my God, I didn't write anything down. But um, I don't think we need that. No. So, <laughs> so since, but we're talking about creative minds and the design process and what, and what happens. Um, the first thing I want to ask you, Naeem, and some of this I know, some of it I don't, is, well, some people don't know that Naeem worked with the legendary Halston right. for many, many years. Um, first of all, what brought you to Halston and how did that experience, being with, in that rarefied air, uh, shape your design process today? Okay, I came at a very, very early age to America. I wanted to go to fashion school in America. So my father, who actually, okay, go back a little bit. My grandfather, who started the embroidery business in India, the company is about 100 years old, and I'm the third generation, and my brother's here too, who's coming visiting from India today. Um, so I grew up under the shadow of my father and my grandfather, but watching, like as a little boy, my grandfather's factories playing underneath the looms of fabric, where hundreds of people were like making beautiful silk flowers on saris. So I, I learned through osmosis and watched my father build a business from nothing into a business where he had 2,000 people working for him. He had an ambition of building a global business. I was at the right age where I wanted to go to school in America for fashion school because I was always interested in fashion. I used to make my own pants when I was 14. So I just loved watching tailors making things for my mother in my house. And I used to hang around in that room with the women were like on the floor cutting patterns and doing things. And somehow that all this stuff seeped through me and I found it very interesting and I wanted to know more and be part of fashion. So my father was coming to America and I wanted to come with him to go to like get admission in school. The only designer that lucky day of mine I was in the hotel room and Halston's, my father said, why don't you come with me to meet this designer called Halston? I'd never heard of Halston. So I go with him and Halston offered me a job to work for him. I was 18 years old. Can you imagine 18 years old meeting Halston and getting a job? I think I was just lucky because I had no <laughs> trade at that time. I just had a big afro. I think he liked that. So tell me what, the, what that was like, soaking it in, being in that air. Obviously, it was a different time. Um, Halston was, was known, obviously, for building an American brand, which at that time, there really weren't uh, famous American designers who had a business, let alone a sort of global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Tell me how, how you worked with him and what you saw there. So as a young boy, 18, not knowing much, I didn't even have the right clothes when I started working for Halston. I didn't even know what snow looked like because when I came from India, I had never seen snow. So first thing he did was like make sure that I got the right wardrobe, right? And then slowly in, like introducing me to like my first month, he said, meet my best friend, come with me. So I walk with him and there's Elizabeth Taylor. And I'm like hanging out with her. He, and he loves saying, this is my new assistant from India. Not India, but India. And then Elizabeth Taylor, and Elizabeth Taylor had no idea. She was saying, tell me about tigers and lions and elephants. I'm like, oh my God, I grew up in Bombay. I never saw a tiger in my life. <laughs> so I used to like, you know, sit there and talk about so many different things. So, you know, with him, working was not only just designing, but it was also this whole grand lifestyle that you lived. And work with him was so interesting because you work for X amount of hours and then you spend X amount of time at Studio 54 and X amount of time at Dr. Giller's house or, you know, these, all these crazy, amazing people, but they had so much to offer. 
like working with Warhol. Warhol would say, Naim, come with me to the factory. I would go to the factory, Warhol, and I would draw poppies. So I was this little kid hanging around with like, like the happening of New York at that time. And I had no idea that I was in the middle of this most amazing movement at that time. So with Halston, I learned not only like to drape things to the, 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 the art of making clothes, one, but the, uh, also the business aspect for it, sitting in through all those meetings with him, going through the, you know, the craziness of you know, not making enough money, making a lot of money, signing licensing deals, signing, you know, like developing fragrances. So all those things were instrumental in shaping me and understanding that you know, who is this woman who wears your clothes when you're with him at those parties with the actresses, it just showed me America in another way, coming from India with a very simple, open, n clean slate, basically, just knowing what my parents did. You know? I, I think that um, it's very interesting and important for anybody that's going to school to be a designer or, or wants to know what that process is like, is sometimes it's not just sitting at a drawing table, it's getting out there in the world, seeing how people live, what movies people are going to, what clubs they're going to, the music that they listen to. And I think that Halston is a, really a perfect example of that, as somebody who lived his life and lived his client. Right, and also I think like going to Studio 54, not that Halston wanted to dance, I mean like he was there actually watching people. I remember sitting with them in the back there, I mean, like watching all these amazing people coming in, and they had their, you know, the craziest outfits. And we would say, okay, that looks amazing tomorrow morning, you know, so it would be taking inspiration from people who really are taking chances on making interesting things on a dance floor, so. A little personal note, I think um, one thing you told me, uh, we were having dinner one night, and Naeem said, you know, once a week or so, I make lunch for my team. And I think he got that from the Halston years of really sitting down with your team. You make the food, and by the way, he's an amazing cook. Um, and you sit down with your team and you take a minute to talk about other things besides what's going on. I think that's so important. I think what, has, what that has, okay, so how it started was at Halston, we used to have lunch together. We had the most amazing chef called Viola. I don't know if you remember, any of, like, probably nobody knows. But anyway, she was from the South. She made shrimp creole we would like have. But, this, but the food that was served was so fantastic. It was all in Elsa Peretti. You had beer in champagne glasses, and you all wore black, and the whole office was burgundy. So you know, it was just, even the whole look was perfect. So, Growing up with him was always like, you know, because what we spoke at the table, what we did last night, who slept with who, who had, what, the, the conversations were always ended up sexually. I mean, like, you know, Halston was just like amazing that way. So I started this trend in my office, uh, I think a year and a half, two ago, that what if I cook for my direct people who work for me, my design, design staff, and every day now I make a meal for 12 people in one hour, that's my challenge, to make a meal and have the best, you know, half an hour eating the stuff. And we share that, and, the, and my staff, who loves me, because I think what has happened is that we've formed such a great bond over this uh, lunch table, and me making these amazing, and we experiment. And in, in, from that, I think I'm gonna have a cookbook. From that, I'm learning so many different aspects of how to make things that I just feel that I can host a dinner for 50 and I can, I can in the kitchen make the most amazing meal because every day, every day, every day, you know, you're cooking and you're learning so many different things. So I think I've got to gain a lot with the love for my staff and learning to cook amazing with all these years of experience. So you bring up something interesting, um, talking about who slept with who the night before <laughs> and who was wearing what. <laughs> Obviously, there came a moment where um, sort of that excess had to take its toll, and Naeem Khan had to make a decision of what he was going to do with his mm -hmm. career. Talk to me about leaving Halston and what that process was and, and what you started to do to lay the groundwork for your business as it is today. 
it was very, very difficult to leave Halston because Halston and I were super close, super close in the sense that like we had dinner every day together, almost every day together, had lunch every day together, and we shared much of times in Montauk going up, you know, he was super close to me. And my decision to leave was on the basis of, I was getting sick from partying with him. Okay. <laughs> no, really, I mean, it was like every three days a night you're at Studio 54. You have to come to work at like 10 o'clock. You, and you didn't have time for your personal self. And I had just met Ranjana, and I just wanted to like, have more time with her. So I, I was at, uh, uh, at the office, and I said to Halston, I'm leaving. I want, he was like totally appalled because what I did, no, but like, you know, embroideries is not so easy. It's not like buying some fabric. I drew everything. I sent it to Asia. I sent it. I, mean, I knew the techniques how to make it. He was like, no, you can't do this to me. So there was Dee Dee Ryan, who used to be his assistant, was a very prominent society lady in New York at one point. She, him, and me go to Mortimer's, and they tried to convince me not to leave. But I was so in love with Ranjana, and I said, I have to leave. I left, and he was livid. And he felt that I had, uh, like, abandoned him. And there was, like, a big war between him and me. And I had to leave New York, so I went to L.A. to start my own studio. I was only 23 years old, and I hired Zsa, Zsa Gabor's daughter to be my PR. And on Rodeo Drive, I got this in the Frank Lloyd Wright building, second floor. I got myself like 3,000 square feet. I thought I was the cat's whiskers because coming from Hals Halston, I was like amazing. I knew everything. Anyway, little money I had made, I put into this project. And of course, at Warhol, I had acquired some big paintings, so I put all the Warhols, had my gray and white studio, and in used to come Frank Sinatra, Gregory Peck with Veronique Peck, you know, um, the Kokorians, and I would make them dresses. But every, nobody wanted to pay, because they were all superstars. They still don't, by the way. <laughs> Within eight months, I had lost every penny I had. And now I am, like, I've got this beautiful space, and I also bought a house, by the way. <laughs> so I was so broke, and I said, what do I do? So I come back to New York, and uh, I made, like, 20 pieces, and I gave it to an agent. First season, he booked me a million dollars, but I didn't have enough money to produce the goods. So I asked my father to give me some money to produce that. My father gave me some money. I produced the goods, and from then on, I've never looked back. So. We need to hear these stories because, you know, everybody goes up, everybody goes down, and I feel like the background that you had in understanding the business was so crucial to, to who you are and, and what you do today. Um, Tell me about some early successes uh, where you knew this is going to be okay. So I did something which I think was clever. I did not start my company under my own name. I started my first company that I gave to this agent under my mother's name called Riazi. So nobody knew who it was. If anybody finds a Riazi somewhere, <laughs> that's worth some money, by the way. <laughs> and... So, I, so it was my practice run, and I did that for 14 years. My kids grew up in that. I, I succeeded tremendously. I learned how to produce. I learned how to distribute. Because, you know, in fashion, it's not easy just making a collection. You have to know how to, you know, distribute the goods, produce the goods, have to look great. Your, your, you know, your agreements with the stores, you know, the money to pay everybody. How do you, so, there was a lot, and I was very young learning this whole thing. So I went through my trial and turbulence through Riazi, and then in 2000, I think, I don't even know, it's been like 10 years, 12 years now since I've had Naim Khan, it's when I said, okay, I'm going to go and have a collection of my own. And everybody said, no, don't do it, don't do it. I just did it. And I, it's like jumping into the ocean, not knowing how to swim. And I figured my way through it. But the good thing is, that I've had many offers to sell my company. I've kept it 100% to myself. 
because I believe what I do is art and I don't want to make it, I don't want to yet commercialize it. I want to keep it so that way it brings me so much happiness, this company, that I just feel like, you know, I don't need to make it into something. How much money do you really need? How many cars do you need? How many homes do you need? I think this company has provided me a well-balanced lifestyle that I can ride this for some time till I can see how I can figure further. So, so the reason I brought up the lunch thing before was um, Naeem proves to me over and over again that beyond being an incredible designer, he's an incredible person. And uh, I think it was a f couple years ago, Naeem talked to me and he said, I think I'm going to do something crazy. I think I'm going to move my operations to Miami. <laughs> And I, t I took a moment and I thought about that and I thought, you know what? Excuse my language. This is on Facebook, we can say. I was like, that's fucking brilliant. Because we need that. We, we need people like you who are intrepid, forward thinking, and changing the way things are done. It's not easy being the first one down the, the path, you know? So tell me why Miami and how that process is going. Okay, so I want to tell you how and why I came to Miami first. I mean, my love for Miami was I came here once, on, somebody invited me to, friends of mine, Colin Cowie, to come and hang out with, so I loved it. I come from India where the sun is always shining, the ocean is there, to me it reminded me of Mumbai. So I was like, this is so beautiful. Anyway, I came here to party, we had, I'd left with a hangover, I said, oh my God, this place is like crazy. <laughs> Reminded me of Studio 54. Still is, right? <laughs> so then I had an interest to play polo. Then I made some friends and I started practicing polo up in Boca. More and more I liked Miami. Then I was at the White House. It was one of Michelle Obama's dinners. And I was so emotional. Really in my heart I felt, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? I'm at the White House. And I grew up in this little, on this little city in India, like, you know, like, come from a very humble family. And that day, the first lady asked somebody to find me through all these hundreds of people that were there and invited me to come up to the apartment and to be, to meet the president. So it was Ranjana, me, and the two of them. And as I was going upstairs to meet them, I said to my wife, I think I should tell the first lady and the president about my Miami idea, that I wanted to do this project. And she said, you crazy, he's the president of the United States, your stupid Miami idea, what are you gonna tell him that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, you're right, you're right, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. So anyway, I go up there and we have a glass of wine and suddenly my nerves are like all feeling good. And I said, Mr. President, I have this amazing idea that I want to <laughs> do this project. And I, he's saying, tell me more. And the more I told him, he's saying, we got to do this. This is the most amazing project. And he really, really like, gave me all the boost I could. I come here, I meet some friends, and they say, connect with this. Walid Wahab helped me so much to find the right you know, people. And then I happened to meet Rosario Kennedy and Tito. And then they took me to the mayor, and from then on, it has catapulted into one thing. First, it was going to be a small office for my atelier. Then I had this idea that why doesn't the school get involved in it? Because nowhere in the world is an, a, a design institution and an education facility together. Because fashion is something that if how I learned, I did not learn through theory. I learn through feel and touch and being there. I think if I can provide these kids a facility that is right next to me, I mean, not right next to them, but they can come and experience, how am I designing this collection? What are the materials? How is this production happening? New York, Miami. I think we can make Miami into a really amazing capital of fashion, but from the base down. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Think of it, it's not just Miami, it's South America. You have so many amazing kids who don't have facilities in South America that they would come and learn in Miami. 
But to have this all in one place where my, my, my facility, my pattern makers, my well, inviting you, let's say, come, inspire the kids, Linda to come, Iris, I mean, all these people who can come help build this into something and to take this vision and make it into Miami, I think it would be incredible. I just got a little bit of chills because I, I think that that's exactly the mind that is needed, not only in design, but in, in every aspect of the creative world. People who take risks, take chance, and give back and help at the same time. So thank you. I think we should give Naeem a round of applause oh, for that. Thank you. thank you. I do, though, have to... Um, go back a little, because, you know, how, how he just glossed over that White House thing, you know, oh, I was just oh, at the sorry. White House one day, and um, I was privy to a story that somebody told me recently. Um, there was a Vogue magazine cover in the 60s, maybe, 70s, of Jacqueline Kennedy, and uh, you'll tell the story better, okay. but, but Wait, no. tell, talk about Jacqueline Kennedy on the cover of Vogue. No, it was... Actually, it was Life magazine. Life, sorry. sorry. So I, I must have been 13, 13 years old and very interested in fashion. And my father used to get all these magazines in his office from America and Europe. Fashion. Magazines. Magazines. <laughs> so Life was one of them. And uh, I saw Jackie O on the cover. And I was with my friend telling her that I one day when I'm a designer, I'll design a dress for the first lady of the United States. I completely forgot about that story. When the first lady wore my dress, wore my dress, my friend called me up saying, do you remember that day? It was like so many years ago that you told me, she was my girlfriend at that time. Like not a, like nothing sexually with 13. So. <laughs> Maybe sexually. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> I'm on my own. <laughs> so I told her, and she was like, okay. So she called me to remind me that, I mean, I just, I just so believe in, you know, like how Miami is happening, how this first lady thing happened. I think there's something about putting your energy out there and what you wish for. It does happen. And I've seen it happen over and over again. I think... Um from visualizing something that you forgot about, touch somebody else to the point that she remembered to call you when that moment happened for you. I just think it's extraordinary and it's quite rare. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. But I have to talk about celebrity and all of these things because it is important in what you do and you obviously dress a lot of uh, actresses and politicians and social people, not only for events, but for red carpets. How Ro Royalty. Royalty. How um, important <laughs> is that for you, for the, for the business? It's super important. In today's world with social media, with red carpet dressing, especially my kind of clothes, it's so important. The amount of press that is generated with an actress wearing your clothes to the right occasion, looking fabulous, that you cannot even convert that in dollars. Like we did a calculation when Mrs. Obama wore my dress, the first dress, worldwide, it was in like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of like publicity. You cannot equate that in dollars. So for a, a brand like mine to create a brand a name that is recognizable, it's super important that celebrities are part of the equation. And we take immense, immense, you know, steps to make sure that we, I mean, sometimes, like, for example, Laverne Cox, the last Emmys, was it, I think? Like, I only wanted to dress one or two people because you don't want to, your dresses to be on every person. And Laverne Cox, for me to dress, was politically right, because what was happening with LB, you know, all that stuff that was going on, I said, okay, I have to dress him, her. And um, I made that dress. I mean, the amount of publicity from it, it's just incredible. 
So you have to be choosy. You have to make sure that you're addressing the right people. And because that's very important for the image of the brand. And it's a very, very important part of building the brand. When um, the first lady, Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. was that a call to your office? Or was that something that you just sort of sent something stealthily or you didn't know or? Well, to my bad luck, um, when the, the dress for the, for the inaugural, right? It was Ikram who was the stylist for her at that time. My sales director, Tim, did not have a good relationship with Ikram because Ikram had a boutique in Chicago that Mrs. Obama used to shop there. So when she became, she came to the White House, Ikram said, you have to wear Naim Khan. Ikram called my office, I was traveling, and, and she couldn't tell what it was for because nobody should know. Nobody gave me a message. Nobody told me, and they were, she was told to buzz off. Okay, so Ikram's gone. My chance of dressing for the inaugural was like really put to bed. This was not good. So Michelle Stein, who's a very dear friend of mine, she runs IFA. She, I'm at lunch with her, and she says, what is wrong with your company? The first lady wants to wear your dress, and nobody wants to even answer the phone. Like, this is crazy. So I said, what, who, when, what happened? And she told me that, this is what happened. You missed the biggest opportunity. I said, okay, you just tell me, tell her to call me directly. So I gave her my number to call me directly. Well, she called me, and that's when I designed the first dress for her. It was the first state dinner for the Indian um, prime minister. But when they called me, I, there was no, with, with the, with the, you know, there's no soliciting for that. So I was like so happy. I mean, like I was really in, and I had two weeks to make this dress. So, but I wanted so much in this dress that was part of my history. So this dress, I said, what, what am I gonna design for her? So it has to be simple, it has to be Halston-esque, America, because that's where I come from. It has to be something to do with Warhol because I was so influenced by him. And a technique that my grandfather, that I learned from. So I took poppies, on a strapless dress, but I manipulated the poppy so that there was no copyright infringement. I had my grandfather's idea of making silver metal. The, when I grew up, all sequins were made in pure gold and pure silver. But there were, used to be like 300 people sitting there, hammering sequin, like walking into this workshop, used to be like crazy for me because I was a little boy and to be there, talk and people hammering things. So the vision of little pieces of silver falling out, falling out from metal pieces has always left things. So I used the same technique. So I took the poppies and I gilded them in silver on new tool. And so that was my first dress for the first lady, which has my history in that dress. I think, um, yes. <clears throat> It speaks volumes for that administration that, um, especially Mrs. Obama, who cared so much, not just about the clothes, she cared about who was making them, what the event was, and the fact that you put all of your influences into this dress might not be seen to, to you or I, but they felt it. And that was a really, it was a stunning, winning moment for you. Oh my God, I mean, like for example, it was, I was here in Miami, it was just before Thanksgiving, I think, that uh, the state dinner, and nobody knew me in Miami. The press went crazy, they were like, below my building, they were like, like ABC, NBC, everybody was there. I, was, I must have done like 800 interviews. And I, I mean, I was having a normal life in Miami, so I, my wife says, okay, I had, she had got a pan that was too big for the oven for the turkey. She said, oh, we need to get a smaller pan. I said, okay, I'll go to the store. So it's like Sunday morning, I'm there in my shorts with my Javiana slippers card, and I'm getting a pan from the top. And the, and the woman says to me, sir, could I have one too? And I turn around, and she says, oh, now you can't. What are you doing in the store? And I'm like, oh my God, people are now recognizing me in the grocery store. So that was my first, like, Miami, like, like you know, it was crazy. The news was spreading so fast. And she wearing it, it was worldwide. Um, <clears throat> talk to me a little bit, 
because I was struck as I was watching the video, because I think people think of you as sort of uh, over the top, mm -hmm. maximal, bling, glitz, all of those things. And I was actually struck by how simple your clothes are. They're, they're quite deceptively simple, which is not an easy thing to do when you're working with that much embroidery. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the, the skill that goes into some of those pieces and what your overall philosophy is. Okay, so the overall philosophy is that you have to make wearable, simple, classic, beautiful textured clothes. And that's important because my clothes, if you, 10 years down the line, you will take it out of your cupboard, you'll, you'll still love it. That's why, like, important to me. Now, 36 years of doing texturing, embroidery, it's a technique that you cannot learn in any school. There is no school that teaches you embroidery like this because there are a billion materials and a zillion ways to sew them. So how do you make it so that it works? So it's all about time that has taken to, it's, you know, to, to develop all these things. So to me, with the philosophy of making classic clothes, keeping it like so that I don't overdo it. When my first collection, you'll see there was like a lot of heavy, a lot of that, but as you go around, you, 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 you start doing more and more, you learn to curtail yourself. This collection was based on this ballerina called Anna Pavlova. But not that she wore stuff like that, but she was a great ballet dancer. But she went around the world, her ideas, and like from Mexico, from India, and she became this famous dancer with all these different techniques that she was taking from all over the world. So basically my idea was, how do I make light clothes this season? Light as air. Some of those tool things, the white thing. But how do I, anybody can take tool and sure it. But the technique of making what I did in that, you first pleat tool, you sure it. You hold it with a cord. But the bottom part, you open it and you stitch a cord. So it's held but open, and then you again in the next panel is shirt again and opened again. So there's so much technique, and so what I've learned from embroideries and all these different things is that there are so many techniques, and now I'm now I'm using these techniques in simple things like with fabrics, with with just with ribbons, with things. So I'm applying the same idea that I would take for little beads or little something like that. So. It's, it's not like one thing. I mean, this is a very wide aspect of doing, you know, texturing. My thing is that I have to keep it light, I have to make it wearable, and I have to make it classic, that you can have it for the rest of your life and you can pass it on to the next generation. Is it your hope that, because sometimes when we talk about these, these techniques, it can be a little bit of a dying... Uh, trade, in a sense. Which is actually, James, it's so true, and this is what my family is trying to keep alive. And that's why my interest in Miami is that my family has been employing some of the best artisans in the world, right, in India, from my grandfather days. We want to keep this work alive. That's why I've made it modern that it is today you guys like it. I want to have people in America learn this trade. Because I find that South America has natural ways of, you know, people do things by hand in South America, more than in the United States. That's why I chose Miami. I felt that there is such a big community of South American people here that I could train them in my facilities or in the school that they can learn this and we can have Miami making high-end couture fabrics of fashion rather than we being known to make t-shirts or $10 things that we used to have that industry in the 70s, which died. We need to be in America making high-end clothing. And I think Miami could be the first of its kind to make these kind of clothes, you know. I agree. I, I think... Um, I think if we could all retrain our, our brains as to what that word luxury is, and I work for a luxury magazine, it's in the title, um, luxury really is not about expense, it's not about logo, um, it's really about skill and craft and artisanship and understanding 
decades of technique and craft. Um, so I applaud you for that because I think that that truly is what luxury is. Sometimes a big price tag comes along with that, um, but, but it's, it's really essential because it lasts. And that's a very important thing. And you know, when you can make luxury in Paris or in Italy, they are getting the same kind of pay like you would get in America. Why aren't we making this here? Why, is Itali why are the Italians making it? Why are the French making it? So to me, my whole goal is that how can I reignite the industry in America through Miami, through the school, through my industry, but slowly, because it's, gonna, it's not going to be something that we're going to say, OK, we're going to have 1,000 people working for us. So it's going to be, and the education aspect of it is so important, because I don't think this is being taught in school. And I want to bring in craftsmen from all over the world so they would be the facilitators or the teachers to the students here in America, and we start here. Your business is so um, fascinating. And at the beginning of the talk, you talked about keeping it smart, not getting too big, not growing beyond. Tell me a little bit about what Naeem Khan, the Naeem Khan brand will look like or what you hope it to look like. Is it this as it is now? Is it licensing? Is it stores? What is it? So I have an overall business plan. My, this business can only grow so much because there are certain restrictions. One is you cannot produce so much because you need X amount of labor to make. So, and there are not so many craftsmen in the world who can make it for you. So this has limitations, this business. But this is a business that creates an amazing amount of noise through the world, through the celebrities, through the royalties, through the movie stars. So now the thing is that we, I need to open four stores, three or four stores, New York, LA, Paris, or London, but making high-end, you know, like wedding, because my wedding collection only started like four and a half, five years ago. And I think we've become the top wedding brand in America because of what the kind of stuff I do. So, and I've been making dresses like for the royal families that can be from 100,000 to half a million dollars a dress. So that royalty, if I can have these shops where people can come in, which are super exclusive, and then you design the thing in a way that it is guaranteed to make money because the, the profitability is so high that you don't have to sell a ton to make money. And you can, you can so there's a formula to that, and we know that. So in Naeem Khan, we keep this, keep growing it slow, but the shops would be the next project. And then you take it into fragrances, shoes, but those are all licensing, where you have, you design it, but it's done by other people, but nobody touches my, my main thing because it's going to be my baby that I want to keep till the day I die. The reason I ask, because I know that there's a lot of students here, um, and it's so fascinating because sometimes designers get a bad rap of being, um, oh, I'm just a flighty designer and I don't care about business, I don't watch my business, I don't know my business. And we've seen examples of that where those designers are not here today, uh, sadly. They they're, couldn't maintain a company. Naeem has both brains, uh, both sides of his brains, working in such a way that is so important in this day and age, in this business. Was that part of your identity for Naeem Khan? Yes, because before I came to America, I, I did one year of School of Economics. So I understood a little bit of but not did the whole thing. So to me, I come from India, I guess Indians have a little more like money kind of, you know, you see, okay, I don't know how to go there, but like fine. Um, I feel that I, I have kept it in a small way. You keep the brand, you work hard, you make it so that way. I mean, you got it, James. Fashion is everywhere. And Naeem Khan has proven tonight that he is not only a brilliant designer, but a uh, fascinating person, uh, a wonderful person who gives back, and uh, a businessman. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Creative Minds Talks. Um, Naeem Khan, thank you very much. I, I know that everyone's going to go home and, and go through their closet and uh, throw some things out or buy some, some new things. Yeah. But thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.